Okay, this is one of my favorite photographs. It's a, uh, a picture taken of Earth in uh, 1990 by uh, Voyager 1 as it left our solar system. And uh, uh, over, uh, nearly 4 billion miles away, Earth appears as a pale blue dot. Can you see it? It's, um, it's from this perspective I want you to think about this talk today. Carl Sagan said that all of the joy and suffering that every human has ever experienced has happened on this fraction of a pixel. And uh, I want you to think about uh, this. On one hand, life, human life, is a thin film on this speck of dust. A speck of dust that's orbiting an average star amongst gazillions of other stars. And from this perspective, life seems meaningless. On the other hand, life is so precious. We're here to, and we're in a very privileged position to be able to experience the, the wonders that humanity can create and our position in the universe. About 10 years ago, I had a realization and I realized I was going to die. Now, we all know we're going to die, but not many people actually really realize it, or we don't realize it every single day. I calculated that I had about 500 months left to live. In fact, most of the people in this room have about 500 months left to live. It's not a, it's not a lot of months. Think about all of the movies that you want to see, all of the books you want to read, people you want to meet. It's uh, suddenly, 500 becomes, becomes a very, very small number. And that doesn't even take into account all of the things that you're going to want to do with your children and your family and your friends. So I did what any rational person would do. I panicked. <laughs> and uh, after I pulled myself together, I decided what I would do is I would try and figure out what life was all about. I'd try and figure out what would give my life meaning. So I decided to allocate some of my months to studying philosophy, psychology, physiology, evolutionary theory, politics, economics. I spent eight years studying this. And I realized that the answer to what gives you a fulfilling life has already been answered by scores of philosophers and scholars over the past 2,000 years. You can find it in the works of Socrates and Aristotle and Plato, Nietzsche, Spinoza, Darwin, Bertrand Russell, amongst many others. What, what is consistent across all of these different writings is this, that our goal is to maximize good. Now, this seems like an oversimplistic view of the meaning of life, but humans are compelled to do what makes them happy. And we, we, we associate what makes us happy with that which is good. Now, this might seem like the, the, the same old cliche of, of what makes you happy? What, what, what do you want in the meaning of your life? And, and most people re respond the same way, which is, I want to be happy. Or, I want to be happy and I want to make other people happy. This is a, a common uh, response. It also seems like a, a cliche that we might have heard over and over again, which is, okay, so given that we want to maximize happiness, what are we going to do? Well, people say, well, find the one thing that you're passionate about and pursue it all your life. So why don't we? Why don't we find that one thing that we're passionate about and pursue it every day? We go to sleep thinking about it, waking up uh, thinking about it, dreaming about it. That's because life is more complicated than that. And if you spend some time looking at motivation theory and, and things like that, you'll realize that we want different things. We're motivated by different things at different times in our lives. Even during the day, we're motivated by different things. And uh, if you do spend some time looking at motivation theory, you'll come across um, uh, models like this, which is uh, Maslow's, uh, uh, Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs, uh, where he, uh, well, these are still very much up for debate, but it gives you a good sense of, of what it is that people want. And they range from the, the kind of physiological, physical, emotional needs, like uh, food and sleep and friends, friendship, through to the higher needs, the 
intellectual, aesthetic, creative needs like giving and learning, teaching. And so what we want is in flux. So it, you might really enjoy reading that book, but if you haven't eaten for three days, then you're going to prioritize eating that bowl of rice over getting through that next chapter. So what you want, what will make you happy changes de determining, depending on the state that you're in. It gets even more complicated. Humans are irrational. Uh, we're especially irrational when it comes to understanding what makes us happy in the short and the long term. And there's plenty of research out there that you can, uh, you can look at. Dan Ar Ar Ariely, for example, very good research on this topic. Not only that, we have hard-coded cognitive biases that make, make us want to uh, eat excessive amounts of salt and sugar and fat. Be able to make us want to gamble when the, the odds are clearly not in our favor. So these cognitive biases make us make bad decisions. We think they're going to make us happy, but in fact, they're going to make us unhappy. Also, we have socially enforced biases. When we're born, we're taught what's good and bad, and sometimes that can be wrong. Think about racism. Think about how we might be able to might treat the, the planet and animals. Think about being told that success is a function of how many cars you have and the size of your house. I would argue that whilst you think they're going to make you happy, they actually don't. And there's plenty of research out there to, uh, to, to back that up. So I want to distinguish between two types of happiness, positive happiness and negative happiness. Positive ha happiness are the, the things that you do that not just make you happy, but have an overall average happiness impact on society. Things like teaching and learning and the intellectual pursuits. Negative happy happiness are the things that you do that might make you happy in the short term, but actually have a negative impact on society. Smoking is a very good example. You smoke, you feel good, but you're damaging the environment. You're damaging yourself that we all have to pay for. And you're giving money to tobacco companies that promote that negative product. So I would say, whilst that makes you happy, whilst you think it's going to make you happy, it actually has a negative impact on society. So talking about trying to improve the overall happiness of society is quite pertinent, given that we're at UCL, founded by Jeremy Bentham, uh, the, uh, the father of uh, utilitarianism, which is a philosophy around trying to increase the happiness of society, the average happiness of society. But you might be asking, what has this got to do with, uh, with innovation? Well, it has a lot to do with innovation. Uh, let's look at the, the definition. I think this is attributed to, to Jobs and, and Bill Gates. Innovation is creativity that ships. And uh, innovation is the process of taking something, some ideas, generating ideas, and taking them through a process of construction, expansion, reduction, till they get to the point where you have a product or a service, what you call a good, goods, that ships, that has value. And we attribute value to that. We attribute value based on how happy we think that that's going to make us. How much are we willing to spend? How much energy are we willing to, to put into it? How much suffering are we willing to, to accept to have that thing? Now, this is kind of like the, the, quanta, the, the uh, Newtonian mechanics of innovation. You have ideas, which are the atoms of innovation, and you construct something that you think has some value in society. I want to talk about the things outside of this. I want to talk about the, the quantum mechanics of innovation. Let's look on this side, ships. So we're producing something that has value. We assign a value to that thing. And as I said before, we might, be able, we might assign value to it that has a negative impact on us and society. So. We have a moral decision when we're, con when we're, when we're purchasing a, a product or, or a good. We need to decide, is this, am I consuming something that has a negative impact on society, that has negative happiness? Or am I contributing to a, a company and a product that's actually going to benefit society, not just make me happy, but has an overall happiness impact? But what about the innovators and the entrepreneurs, many of which I can see in the audience? What is, what is, what is motivating you 
to create stuff? Is it money? Is it power? Are those motivations going to make you happy? Are those motivations going to create positive happiness? That's up to you to decide. I would argue that things that create positive happiness, things that you create, is good innovation. Now, we already saw that creativity, that innovation is creativity that ships. I want you to think of it the other way around. Shipping things that create. Think about creating things that will benefit society, will that allow you guys to satisfy your basic needs, but also satisfy your passions, the intellectual needs. Are you consuming? Are you, or are you contributing? There's lots of bad innovation in the world. There's things out there that pacify us, drugs and alcohol, junk food, things that distract us like gossip and money and, and status, and things that delude us like dogma and uh, pseudoscience and the supernatural. And I think what is important to realize is that each individual here has a potential to have some sort of global impact. The things that you create can actually affect the planet. And when you're making decisions, whether you're buying something or creating something, try and think, is this thing going to be beneficial for society or is it just going to be benefiting me and somewhere, somewhere else is going to be ripped off by it? I know the meaning of my life. I know what I've decided to do with my short time on this planet. And that's to try and push the boundaries of science and, and technology and innovation and entrepreneurship to try and create a world where people have the freedom to be able to create, find, and explore their passions. And I hope to live in a world where I'm basking in the warmth of your fire. Thank you.